work love body is an exploration of the experiences of Australian women during the pandemic. And I think most importantly, it asks questions about what happens next. And we know from history that huge cataclysmic events like world wars, great depressions, pandemics, what happens in their wake is that policy changes, the way government does business changes, the way people interact with one another changes. And we have an opportunity as we emerge from the pandemic to change Australia for the better when it comes to women. And this book is about exploring what that might look like and what we can learn from the last 18 months or so to take us forward into the future. It was our attempt to understand what was going on at the height of the pandemic last year. And I note that we're now in an entirely different but just as um, distressing period of the pandemic. And I don't think we could ever have imagined that to be the case when we originally started on this project. But what was happening was that women were coming out of work, um, giving up work, uh, and then they were under extreme pressure at home. Uh, and that's if they had successful families and relationships. Uh, if they didn't and they were under pressure, you know, they were in a violent home or had children or family members that needed caring, there was even additional pressure on them. Uh, and we wanted to take a look at what that looked like and what it could ultimately mean for the lives of women into the future. And I'm just going to um, pause and say there were two very different strands at that time. There was Melbourne and there was Sydney, or there was Victoria and there was New South Wales. And the, the full brunt of pressure was bearing down on the women in Victoria. And I don't think that there was any real appreciation for that. Uh, and I mean me in particular, uh, even though I was talking to people in Victoria and Melbourne every day, didn't fully understand the pressure that they were under. So we wanted to unpick what that meant and then potentially look at what it could lead to. What were the positives? What could we learn out of it? What could we learn from flexible work arrangements? What we could learn about caring arrangements? What could we learn about it from our mental and physical health? Um, and then uh, all the way through to from a policy perspective. So could you resolve uh, some of the issues for women into the future? So it's a roadmap of hope. Uh, to give women uh, something to think about in terms of their own personal lives, um, but also uh, for policymakers and decision makers and influencers and leaders to look at what we could do into the future that might have a genuine impact uh, on the lives of women. There were the really practical challenges of the fact that this book has five authors. I have written the introduction, Helen McCabe has written the conclusion, and then we have three extraordinary writers who have contributed a chapter each, Jane Gilmore, Santilla Shingaipe, and Emily Brooks. And between us, we are situated across three different states. And each of those states were having very different experiences of the pandemic. There were moments where Emily, who was living in South Australia, was living a pretty normal life. And at the same time, I was living in Victoria and was living the opposite of that. I was living a very small life. I was living pretty much in the confines of my own house or within my own five kilometers. So that presented some challenges. The other thing was the challenge for the writing because we have been writing history as it is unfolding. And while that gives us this really exciting vantage point in that we get to be some of the first female perspectives on this history in Australia, when you're writing history as it happens, it keeps happening after your due date, which could be really frustrating. So as we were sending this book off to the printers, uh, Sydney was going into lockdown and we were looking at a lockdown that we thought might be two weeks long. We thought could be a little bit longer. And now 10, 11 weeks on, we know that it went a whole lot longer than that and will continue to be. And so the book had to evolve and be written in such a way that it captured the possibilities that might come in the future, the possibilities that we couldn't possibly know while we were writing. I'd like to hope that it's shifting. I do think that the last 12 months have been hugely significant for women who feel that they've been treated unfairly at work, particularly for women who have been sadly the victims of sexual assault or sexual harassment. It feels like Australia is finally paying attention. 
that Australia is finally taking something seriously. Because of course, the Me Too movement, which hit the world several years earlier, didn't take off in, I'm going to say that in, in, because I can't think of a better phrase, but it didn't take off here at home in the way it did across the world because of our tight defamation laws. So I think Australian women had their moment at the beginning of 2021, where there was this understanding of, okay, if sexual harassment and assault and even rape can allegedly happen to women in the halls of our parliament, literally inside the walls of the building where our laws are made, then clearly it can happen to any of us. And I, I had the privilege of speaking at the rally in Melbourne in March of this year and seeing thousands and thousands of, of, of men and women who were saying, no way, enough is enough, things have got to change. And the thing about COVID is that it is all encompassing. It has swallowed our news cycle. It has swallowed the focus of policymakers. And right now, we have to focus on the health questions. We have to focus on keeping people safe. We have to focus on an economy that makes sure people are in work and so they can feed their families. But what Work Love Body does, and the questions we're asking are, what happens as we emerge? Because as we emerge from this pandemic, we've learned a lot. We've learned a whole lot about ourselves, and we've learned a whole lot about what policy can do. So what are we gonna change? What are we going to demand? What are the, going to be those big questions women are asking as we come out of this period of the acute health phase of the pandemic? I think there is enormous uh, potential for the educated and the well-off to really benefit from this, that they are seeing that they can run their organization or their lives or their family life from home uh, and in, a, in a, or in some ways in a hybrid set of circumstances where they can work a couple of days from home um, they've also seen that they've they've seen that what their partner does and how he or she works and what the sharing arrangements might look like um, and we've know, we know we can work from anywhere. We can work from a country town, we can work from the beach house, we can work from the inner city um, apartments. So there's an enormous freedom in that. And that, that's incredibly uh, exciting for many women to, to renegotiate their, their work and their life arrangements. Um, that said, there, there's also a lot of anxiety and a lot of questioning around meaning. So, do we need a, Do we need the extra pair of shoes, the extra handbag, the second car, the beach house? Why don't I just live in the beach house? Do I really need the city house? Um, consumption, materialism, the concept of power and wealth. I think there is a lot of thinking around that. Then switch to women who are nowhere near as lucky. They don't have the education. They don't have the family network or the support networks. And they don't really have the opportunity to fix it uh, as such, they are, they're trapped. And we're seeing that really powerfully at the moment. And I think New South Wales is an interesting example because there are two, there are two sets of circumstances in New South Wales right now. There's the Western suburbs where women are living in small apartments with a couple of kids and a, and a partner. Um, and some of them are essential workers. So they're, they're actually traveling into and out of, um, you know, the danger zones for COVID and COVID is killing people. So I still am concerned, or I guess my concern is heightened that the, the disparity between those two stories might grow, that we might not be in a position to do a lot about it. And the reason I say that is because we're throwing money all over the country. There's the spending that's taking place um, currently by this conservative government is beyond comprehension. There's a trillion dollars of debt and not a lot of room to, to borrow anymore. And those debts are gonna to have to be paid. And we know what that looks like. That is increasing taxes um, and less spending. So I do think there are some alarm bells on the horizon. Uh, and and I, it's something that Jamila and I talk a lot about in terms of our work at Future Women, how we work in both camps to support the women that are well off and have opportunities to reimagine their lives, um, but also how we work with the women in the more disadvantaged end and hopefully give them some opportunities um, 
to, to see their way through what I think is going to be a pretty difficult time in the years ahead. Absolutely, some changes that need to happen as we emerge from this pandemic. And I might touch on a few of them to begin with. Uh, Glyn Davis, who is CEO of the Ramsey, Paul Ramsey Foundation, told a Future Women podcast a couple of months ago now that if you were amongst the poorest of Australians, it is quite possible that 2020 was the best year of your life. And for Work Love Body, we spoke to a woman called Julie. And when Julie had this quote put to her, she burst into tears and they were tears of guilt. Julie's a single mum, she's got two small kids, and she says that the coronavirus supplement pay payment changed her life. That while she knew there were people all over the world and all over the country doing it incredibly tough, she spent six months feeling guilty because she hasn't been that relaxed in her entire life. She could pay her rent, she could pay her bills ahead of time. She said her pantry cupboards were full, she didn't have to worry about how she was going to feed the kids the day before payday. And she felt awful about that. But I think what that shows is that the payments that were made during that time, the way we looked after people who really are living at the margins, struggling to make ends meet week to week was life changing. And we know that most of them are women in particular, most of them are older women. So I think there's a question absolutely about welfare and about the payments we're able to give to people to support them. I think what the government did with JobKeeper, despite some of the criticisms and uh, the fact that it was imperfect, it was done in a rush. I think it was extraordinary. I think it was extraordinary. I think it had kept our country afloat. And I think there are things we can learn from it for the future. Another one I'd raise is the shadow pandemic that we know happened during last year and this year which is that while perhaps you and I were told to stay home, to stay safe, we were fortunate that our homes were safe places. There are so many women in this country for whom home is not a safe place, for whom being stuck at home without access to those moments away from the control of a potentially violent partner were so few. And that meant they were in a huge amount of danger. And a lot of women who perhaps may have wanted to leave violent relationships found that harder than ever before. And then the final one I'm going to mention is mental health, because we know that while Australia has fared reasonably well on the physical health front compared to the rest of the world, that in stage four restrictions, when they were announced in Victoria last year, we have the data that says Lifeline saw a 30% increase in calls from Victorians during that period. Um, there has been a huge increase in the number of people accessing mental health support and the government's made funding for that available but mental health isn't something that gets dealt with quickly uh, mental health challenges aren't something that are going to go away when the pandemic ends uh, this is something that's going to be with us for a very very long time and i think a lot of australians are going to be living in the shadow of what they experienced during the depths of the covid crisis i want women to feel hope that we are on the verge of significant improvement in the quality of the lives of Australian women. And it might not happen in their lifetime, but what we've learnt and what, who we've seen, like we've seen women who we don't normally see. Um, and I was saying in an earlier interview, single women are mostly been ignored in every possible way, but the singles bubble, for example, and suddenly everyone's talking about single women and how they, um, and how they live. So I would like there to be a sense of hope that there will be improvements uh, and potentially fast tracked and that a lot of the measurements of success or influence that we've come to value will be less important in the future. My message for Australian women would be that the pandemic has changed everyone's lives, but just because it has changed someone's life in perhaps a potentially more devastating way than your own, doesn't mean you don't get to be hurting. I think a lot of us right now are kind of shrugging off the pain. There's a lot of 
my friends interacting with one another and saying things like, well, you know what? I have still got a job. I've got nothing to complain about. Or, you know what? I've got a safe home to go to at night. I, I, I'm absolutely fine. Now, I think it's really good to recognise that you might have a privilege that other people don't. But at the same time, I know health workers who are saying things like, well, I get to go to work every day, so I'm lucky. And yet they are going to the my local hospital and they are seeing people struggling for breath and dying every afternoon. And yet on the flip side, you've got the woman who's staying at home, who's a single mum and is looking after four children and trying to homeschool as well as work saying, well, I don't have to leave the house to work, so I'm lucky. So if I had a single message, it would be that we all just need to cut ourselves a little bit of slack. Everyone is doing it tough. Everyone's mental health is being pushed and it's okay to be finding it hard. You can get your copy of Work, Love, Body right now at Booktopia, uh, booktopia.com.au.